uh, I don't know, a lot of you weren't here on Friday, but some of you were. Um, I said then and I'll say now, I met Jeff when I was 17 in a grimy coffee house that you kind of had to be there for. With a stage far less structurally sound than this one. <laughs> um, this poem needs context. And that's terrible because poems shouldn't need context, but this one does. Everybody who knows Jeff knows two things. He loved pirates slash he was a pirate. <laughs> In particular, he felt a great affinity for Blackbeard. And um, as you can see, this is a love that we share. My affinity was for Anne Bonny. Um, we shared the understanding that pirates were like a proto-maritime workers uprising who democratically elected their captains. We considered them our mm, early comrades. <laughs> I've also toyed with this idea that because Anne Bonny survived the gallows after the big names like Vane and Calico Jack and Blackbeard died, that she was 76 in the year 1776, and I wondered what someone who lived through all of that, trying to choke the empire in its cradle, thought as an old woman watching the revolution unfold. And so from all of those places, and I've taken up too much time with an intro, I wrote this. And it's called 76. Historians will call me a liar, but history is written by those who have hanged heroes. One. She sits in the half illumination of lifeless whale oil glow in a tiny house by the sea, a place with good bones, but that nonetheless could never quite manage to take on the fragile shape of home. The outside world is a screaming, bloody infant birthed bitterly, but she can no longer make out the details, the bending light of burning fury, nor the width and breadth of the chasm opened the gaping maw under the feet of the throne. Two, there's a window in the eastern corner of the coldest room of every house she has ever occupied that has not been shut in 50 years, lest she worries he cannot find his way back. Worn souls in their salt water tracks everywhere. He leaves the smell of rope and gunpowder. He is not real. He is calico lies, but the window stays open. Three, do you remember, she says to no one who is any more alive, do you remember when we tried to strangle this new world, this strange new prison of a stolen world and its jagged cradle? Do you remember how they fell, one by one, the ghosts of Nassau, Tartuga, Kingston, the Cape, and Ocracoke for all of our troubles? <clears throat> do you remember the glorious terror tightening the neglected muscle in the center of every rich man's chest? mirroring his constricted trade routes, a terror created by the roar of our frenzied collective understanding that empires persist only when we believe them to be inevitable and we would never believe that again. I have walked with giants, with legends, with honest men, with beards of flame enough to turn kings to stone. Do you remember, friends, when we dared to be free and they'd hanged you for it. No great hardship, Mary had said then, but then Mary hadn't seen the rope coming. Do you remember the way the earth shook where you stood on the day that Blackbeard left us? A merry life and a short one. This, a well-carried line in well-worn pockets whispered to well-worn hearts haunted by too goddamn many empty chairs. Too many friends called monsters, called titans to name. Too many myths and storybooks who to her were nothing more or less than her own flesh whose decay held her secrets and her heart. And though, as though infamy purchased immortality could be contained by the swaying of a gibbet. Every soul to discover themselves on the lips of emperors and tyrants, called hostis humani generis, called the common enemy of all mankind, keeps these lines as wards, charms, protections against the noose and the cell and the bone cold that only those who were hunted and hated by pamphleteers and parsons will ever know. Give me hell, it is a merrier place. 
On nights, the regulars march. She wills herself an incautious young woman, still copper hair tinged with wood smoke, Jamaican rum on her breath, spinning the future with gyromancies, telling tales and readying her pistols to ride with them. Still, she cannot help but wonder when the slaving masters they now fight for will reveal themselves indistinguishable from old monarchs. Whether or not the skull and bones of her brothers, lovers, and comrades stir at the cries of liberty or death, but somewhere she holds a deep and sober knowledge that Charles Vane is shouting past a veil that each year she ages has tattered, do not trust them. These men who will offer a pittance of a wage for your life have only surrendered crowns and titles in favor of a more modern aesthetic. Is anything ever truly for nothing? Can any distant part of this dying earth that our blood still fertilizes be so far away? Time and the histories of biased men disordered the shimmer of their struggle. The sharpness of stars against the black calm of the sea would not find its way into any history book, nor would the way they laughed in the face of the men who would kill them. What is lost in the endless cycle of creation of heroes, of villains, and the winner-take-all narrative reality of future tellings is the truth. Curious little feet find their way up her path at least once a week. Though her name had changed and though the posters never did do any of them justice, town folk whispered, and while the older ones kept a wide berth, the children require stories. More recently, their unlined faces sought a comfort that their papas could beat the lobsters with their ships and their guns and royal majesties, just as well as the old woman living at the edge of the sea. She could not bear to tell them the exact weight of loss, its shape or proportion, or the precise manner in which one's entrails are messily excised by sorrow, regret, and gaps in memory. So she told them instead of the dark-haired man with the booming laugh, who was feared by all but those who loved him. And she dared them to hope and fight and bleed until they had no more breath. This, she said, is how we lived. This, she said, is how you will too.